anyways, let's let's get this started. All right, so uh, here's my Cali. Um, you know, I'm going to uh, open up a thing and I'll make a uh, just a new CTF, just a directory that we can kind of uh, do our work in. And uh, let's move over here to the uh, CTF uh, window, uh, the actual CTF VM that's running. Now, I was originally going to do um, Maze, which was one that was posted. And if you follow me on Twitter, uh, I, I retweeted as a bookmark, uh, which is a lot of fun. The thing is that CTF is currently going right now. So um, I don't want to do an instructional, an instructional live stream for a, for a um, CTF that's still going. This one's from February. Uh, there are solutions posted online if you are so inclined. So I don't have any, uh, you know, I don't have any qualms with, with uh, showing people how to solve this. So uh, the first thing we're going to do, and I didn't do it, is look here and it actually tells us which IP address it is so we can skip all that crazy ARP stuff that we've had to do in the past. Uh, we're doing uh, 192.168.1.213. So uh, we will, first things first is we're going to end map it. Um, dash P dash is a shortcut for let's scan all ports because uh, we don't know if they're going to have some funky open port that's, you know, a port uh, six, uh, five, uh, five, three, four or something janky that'll throw us off if we just scan the default ports with Nmap. Uh, we're also going to do the dash A to run uh, all of the default uh, NSEs or Nmap uh, scripting engine scripts, uh, which is, you know, it just runs a handful of useful ones. It doesn't go overboard, but kind of gives us more information about the target uh, than we would get from a stand like a default Nmap scan. And we'll do 192.168.1.213, uh, right? See, I talk too much and then I forget things. Yeah, 213. Uh, and then another thing that we'll do, and this is handy, I like to do this. Um, you know, I, I usually do outputs, uh, I usually do the greppable output, but um, the. Uh, um, sorry, I just got a text and then I got confused. Uh, I like to do the greppable output, but there are other useful outputs. So. Um, this is something the 504 instructor turned me on to while we were uh, talking. And so just minus O capital A is all outputs. And then we'll call this uh, uh, secure CTF, which is the name of the CTF. So we're going to have like three or four uh, files that get output to this directory, starting with secure CTF um, that are different uh, output formats. That way later, if we need to go back and, uh, you know, look at our notes or include, um, you know, uh, Nmap scans as part of our reports later, uh, we can and we have multiple uh, different types of outputs. This is uh, greppable. I think this is just normal text and then an XML. We can use those for various uh, other tools that uh, support Nmap as an input. Uh, but here we have a, a pretty basic thing. We, uh, it looks like it's just running a HTTP server uh, on port 80. No other open ports. Um, uh, URL connectivity checker is the title of the uh, page, and this is this is just output from one of those scripts that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so you know, this is uh, it looks like it's going to be pretty straightforward so far. So anytime I boot up a a uh, web browser on a pen test or a CTF or um, you know, hell, half the time when I'm just browsing the internet, uh, I always like to to boot up Burp uh, again. Uh, it's just using the BERT free, so you know this is all functionality that you can use at home. Nothing special. Um, the difference between the free edition of BERT and the community or the uh, paid version, um, the free version has some throttled functionality. Uh, for instance, the intruder is a, uh, a type of brute forcer or fuzzer, and um, the more requests you make through the brute forcer, uh, the um, the more requests you make through the brute forcer, the slower the next request will go. Uh, my headset just cut out. Sorry about that. Um, I do not have music playing in the background. See, this is the first stream that I've done in ages, and of course I forget everything that I have to do. Uh, anyways, so what will happen is if you have to do any more than 100 brute force requests, it's going to start going really slow in free edition. Uh, and then also in free, uh, you don't have access to uh, where to go. 
the like the scanner it's got a, a fairly decent ish um you know web app security scanner uh where i can find some stuff um you know it's not going to find a ton of stuff in like custom web apps but it helps also there's a store um at, at a, a um here we go the bap store and if you notice under the details section here so a lot of these require the full burp suite because it takes advantage of uh you know some of the functionality that comes in burp suite pro like the uh the intruder functionality and whatnot so anyways that's a quick rundown of that um i just like to kind of pimp burp suite whenever i can because it is very useful to me uh i don't work for them or not sponsored by them or anything i just i really like that tool so uh oh my god and just go to the it's just running on port 80 uh and proxy is intercepting let's turn that interception off so here we go we have this um we have this input thing in our url you'd like to test so we'll go ahead and test it uh and it gives us this kind of weird output and then the result of it it looks like so um i am used to this kind of output this looks like a curl output probably um some other tools have used this output in the past um i'm familiar with this because i did linux administration for a long time but um you know you can kind of tell that something's going on in the background regardless so if we do something like uh, uh you know this is likely something like in the web backend uh if we think about how this application is written uh there's probably a piece of code here that says um you know curl um you know above it is like a you know a equals and then whatever input we get whatever the the variable assigned to this input is and then underneath it's like curl dollar sign a or something saying run curl on whatever the variable a is equal to and then we get this so if we think about it like that maybe we can get this guy to run other commands um in linux uh a simple way to run another command is to do use the uh, semicolon uh semicolon just says hey i'm done with this command i want you to run another command after it right so let's um you know run like uh id you know to see who we are ah see and it knows that uh a semicolon is bad that we shouldn't be using semicolons in a in a url uh so it, it is blacklisted that so we could pack up and go home or uh there's another way to try and run multiple commands in a linux command line and that's with the ampersand so we'll run ampersand ampersand which basically says hey when you get done doing this do this as well uh and then we'll just do the same thing give it a shot and it is blacklist the ampersand as well unfortunate so what do we do well uh if we can get it to go to arbitrary websites uh maybe that's an attack vector um for uh something right we can get it to uh just get at something and we know that curl itself um is usually used for loading web pages well what happens when you load a web page well you're you're basically downloading it right you're downloading it to your system and your browser displays it in some form of cache uh well curl is actually like downloading the thing uh there is no web browser that has some sort of cache and displays it for you um it just downloads it uh and if we look at our own box and i do this a lot um as, you know i'm running some sort of linux box and i the target box is a linux box and i'm like hey how does this command actually work what are some of the neat things we can do with it um so i'll just run man curl on my own box so i can kind of get more information because i use a lot of these tools a lot but i don't necessarily know literally everything it can do uh and we're going to look through to see if there's a way to instead of just displaying the page or you know if we look you go curl uh you know google.com and we run that uh we get its code right and this is just saying hey you need to actually go to uh www uh google.com let's do this okay yes yes google uh google.com now the k is a uh, shortcut for like no secure or no search checking or something like that we don't actually need it but actually we don't actually need it um you'll need that for when you're running against uh like ctf machines that have self-signed certs and stuff but 
should just be able to do this. And then we get the code of Google. Like this, if you actually inspect the source code on google.com, that's what it's, this is what it's going to look like. Um, so if we can get it to download arbitrary code, uh, then maybe we can get it to run arbitrary code. But how do we get it to not just display to the command line, right? We don't want it just to display there. Uh, so we want to figure out a way for it to write it out to a file. So let's man curl. And we're going to look through. And typically, if you're familiar with Linux, you're familiar with kind of how commands work and how commands run. Um, you might see something like, uh, you know, a lot of times it's like dash W for write or dash O for output or, you know, something to that effect. So let's just do a quick search. Uh, and in man, we're using either less or more. I think modern distributions use less. So you can use this search command, which is just slash, uh, and then your search string, uh, which I want to search for dash O. Dash, it looks like dash O file. Uh, we'll use N uh, just to kind of keep going through um, until we find the actual uh, listing for dash O. Did I miss it? These, sometimes it's not as uh, straightforward as you want. Oh my god, it's probably, I probably missed it. Oh, wait, found it. Okay, here we go. So it's either dash O or dash dash output, uh, and then just the file name after it. Okay, cool. So we can get it to output to a file. Um, let's do something interesting. Uh, I do not believe to date uh, that we have used Metasploit in any of the uh, live streams that I've done so far. Um, take it or leave it. I don't. I don't really know what to say about that. It is something that is heavily used uh, by some people and not used at all by others. And uh, whatever. Uh, if you're doing the OSCP or the PWK, you know they warn you. Oh, you're not going to be able to use it much on the test. Uh, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't know how to use it. It is a helpful tool. Um, Meterpreter itself is a very helpful shell uh, if you can get away with it. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you can. Uh, but we're going to use that today uh, just because I like it when I can. And especially CTFs, uh, it just makes it uh, super simple in most CTFs because that uh, extra functionality that we'll explore is, is nice. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, show you a command called MSF Venom. Let's do a minus H real quick just to show kind of what it does. All right, so it's it's basically a uh, payload generator for Metasploit. That's all it is. Um, and then you get some options. So P is to specify your payload. L is to list the format type or list the um, list options for the types of payloads. So if you want to list a payload, an encoder, a knob sled, etc. Um, you can make your own knob sled. Uh, if you need that for, you know, if you're uh, inserting a payload into a custom exploit or something, um, you know, minus F for format, saying what type of formats are available. Well, actually, those are pretty useful, so let's uh, run this real quick. Um, you know, which encoders to use, architectures, etc. And then we got a crap ton of uh, different uh, formats that you can run. Um, whether you want ASP, you want, uh, you know, let's see here, uh, MSI, you want EXEs, um, you know, you want it in Perl, you want it in Python. Uh, where's the one? I guess it doesn't show it here. Um, yeah, so this is a PHP page, so we're going to want a PHP uh, payload. The executable, it's not in the formats because the payload itself is, is a PHP payload, so we don't have to specify a format. Um, you'll notice, <clears throat> let's, let's open up another tab here real quick. We're going to do, uh, we'll do MSF console. We're going to have to set up a listener for our reverse shell in a minute anyways. Um, but I want to show you kind of the correlation between MSF, the, the different parts of Metasploit. Um, when we do MSF payload, and then we'll do uh, MSF payload, or MSF Venom, sorry. MSF payload's the old one. Uh, and then we'll list payloads. Uh, and then we're going to grep, because it just outputs to standard out. Uh, we're going to grep PHP. Uh, and then here in MSF, this is the MSF console. 
Uh, it always has a, a snazzy little uh, opening ASCII art for you. Um, but here we are, and this is completely free. There is a Metasploit Pro available. Um, unless you're a big enterprise, I've not really made use of it. it this is fine for you know CTFs and war games and uh, even small-time engagements. I'm not sure what the licensing is for using it in a professional and using the, the community edition in uh, uh, like a commercial environment, like on an engagement. Uh, I haven't had to worry about that yet, um, but maybe if you went here to learn more, I don't know. But so we're going to search payloads. Um, and we'll just kind of give this a matter of fact, can I search payloads PHP? So Metasploit has a concept of the database. Uh, it can build and, and attach itself to a database, which speeds up these searches considerably. In addition to what to that, uh, it'll also save information uh, that you find in um, like auxiliary scans through using auxiliary module, modules. A lot of them are scanners like looking for uh, SNMP enumeration or you know what's vulnerable to shell shock, etc. Uh, so it'll actually save target information in that database. So it's pretty good. Once again, on an engagement, you can uh, uh, do you can set up this database and uh, use that functionality. Um, a really good resource for learning Metasploit is the Metasploit Unleashed uh, over at Offensive Security. It's a free kind of workshop on their webpage that goes over various things. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Maybe I'll do a live stream just on Metasploit, uh, kind of go over the stuff that I'm uh, briefly uh, uh, briefly going over, you know, kind of skimming over. But here's all of our uh, PHP payloads. Uh, you can see the, the file format's pretty simple to read. You know, it's a payload, it's a PHP payload, it's a bind. Uh, Perl. Uh, it's a download executable. Uh, here's the interpreters. They're reverse shells, bind shells. Uh, very readable and straightforward. Uh, over here, same kind of thing. Uh, here's all the PHP payloads. So same stuff that you can get in Metasploit that you could use as a payload for a exploit that you're, you know, slinging across the wire. You can just generate them here, ready made for whatever. So we're gonna MSF Denim. We're gonna P for payload, and we're gonna do the reverse TCP. This guy here, uh, and then the reverse TCP. If you look, let's use this. And we'll show options, and it has it takes an L host and an L port. Basically, what address am I binding on, or what address locally to me are we gonna contact, and on what port? Those are taken as options here, so we'll do L host. And this is not uh, case sensitive, by the way. These are done in case, but they're not case sensitive, so you don't have to hold down, use the con uh, you know cruise control for cool or anything like that. Um, my L host is two one two twelve and two one six eight one dot two twelve, and my L port. Uh, I am not going to use the default 4444 because don't get in that habit. That's terrifying. Um, we're going to use, uh, let's do uh, 52631. Sure. Um, oops, sorry. Oh, no, that's right. Uh, that should be it. We don't need a file format because it's going to output in PHP. Um, so we'll go ahead and get that going. Uh, it's usually not a bad idea to use something like, oops, um, uh, to it's legit uh, PHP. Um, it's usually not a bad idea to use a, a port like 80 or 443 um, because, um, you know, it looks less cons like suspicious. If you're doing a, a large CTF or something though, like uh, NetWars for instance, there's going to be a lot of people owning the same machine and you want to use something random uh, so that people don't stomp, stomp on each other's sessions. Additionally, um, you know, 80 or 443 might not look suspicious on a client machine, but if I'm looking at a server and it's connecting to something on 80 or 443, I'm like, what in the hell is going on there? Uh, this could be an ephemeral port for some random communication. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, not a lot of my, not a lot of my servers connect to anything over the web.
So uh, now we've got our uh, shell here, totes legit, and it, it's going to look like this, you know. So if we cat totes legit, that's what we see. Cool. So how do we get that here? Uh, let's see. Let me turn down my headphones a little bit. It's a little crazy. Okay. Uh, how are we going to get this here? So we are going to. Uh, it wants us to put in a URL. We need to host a web server. So we could set up Apache, which is crazy. Uh, we could do something like uh, Netcat. We can listen on, uh, you know, let's say 8080 here, and then we can go. Um, uh, what happened here? HTTP 192.168. Oh my God. Maybe 88 is already bound to something. Uh, and we're 212, so we'll do 9999. Uh, and then we're trying to get totes legit. PHP. Totes, not tote. Right? Yeah, totes legit. So we go. It grabbed the thing. Yeah? Is it trying to download it? I don't know what's happening here. It's like downloading it, trying to run it. What's happening? Uh, what uh, what port did we this on? Doesn't seem to be trying to run. I don't know. Empty reply from server. Weird. Uh, to be honest, I know that you people use Netcat to uh, like do stuff like this. Really, to me, all it's good for is grabbing this. Uh, it's not actually running a web server. Uh, it doesn't really know um, what the hell is going on. Um, so what I like to do is we can use Python. A simple Python one-liner uh, will, using the Python-m simple HTTP server, uh, and then afterwards we can do whatever uh, port we want. And so we'll just do 9999 again. And now it's serving up HTTP on 9999. Uh, there's two benefits to this. One, it's an actual web server that knows what get means and you know return status codes and all that. Two, Netcat will open at, open a session or open a, a listener port, be connected to it. Once that's done, it closes it. Now the Windows version of Netcat uh, you know, has some like a slot dash P or dash capital L or something that like has some sort of persistent listener, but um, I don't run, I don't personally run that cat on Windows very often. Uh, and then beyond that, we don't need to do anything crazy like that. Python gives us this little simple thing that we can go and we can hit this over and over and over again and it won't kill itself until we're ready for it to die. So uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, if you're a Python 3 shop or you like Python 3, you've already made that move. Um, it's just HTTP dot server for Python 3 and then same same uh, syntax here. So HTTP dot server 9999. Boom. We're listening. Uh, we're going to 192168. It's right here. So it's legit. Go. We get it. Uh, code 200. It's done. Sweet. Downloaded it. All right. Um, here's the deal. Oh, we wanted to, uh, what do we want to do? We wanted to do something funky, right? We wanted to tell it to output that because right now it just wrote this code, excuse me, just wrote this code to the, uh, uh, standard out, right? If we do it from here, if we, uh, um, let's curl, um, Actually, let's do exactly what we just did, right? We can see what happens. We just do this. It just writes it out to standard out. So we need to minus O uh, from the man file that we found earlier. We'll minus O, and we'll say we want to write it to uh, to its. Eh, we'll be we'll be super stealthy and call it shell.php. Just you know, cause. Oh man, permissions denied. Okay, so we can't write to this directory. 
uh, that's unfortunate. Um, well, let's think about what we're actually trying to do here. Um, if we're trying to get it to download malicious code, we also want it to, we want to be able to run that malicious code whenever we want. Um, so just going through and enumerating a ton of files or directories on the web server that we can, the server itself that the web user can write to isn't necessarily helpful. We can very likely write to uh, var, or I mean, uh, tmp slash temp, because uh, that's kind of what it's for. Um, but we don't necessarily want that because it's not going to get us anything, right? So if we do, uh, just let's do that, uh, shell.php. See, it did that fine, uh, but what do we, how do how the hell do we get to that? We can't get to that. Uh, that's pretty useless to us. Um, if there was some other functionality of this website, if we could, if there was something else that had like a local file include vulnerability, uh, where we can say, okay, now uh, you know, go to this path on the server and and run that file, maybe that'd be useful. Um, that is not terribly uncommon in real world scenarios. Uh, but it's not useful here. So what do we do? Um, well, maybe there are some other uh, directories in the web server that we can look for. Um, maybe there's you know some kind of uh, you know staging area for admins to to post stuff to. Uh, who knows? So we're going to use a, a, a command called derby. And there's another uh, uh, GUI command called derbuster. Um, and what I want to what I want to instill while we go over this derby or derbuster functionality is that this is a brute forcer. Uh, it will request a ton of directory possibilities and then tell you when it finds one. This is very useful uh, for finding uh, like information information leakage or you know hidden directories that weren't supposed to make it to production but did. Uh, but it is incredibly noisy. Uh, don't use these um, nine times out of t 99 out of 100 times. Don't use these on bug bounties. Um, they will not thank you for it. In fact, any sort of brute forcing is typically out of the scope of a bug bounty. And generally speaking, you don't want to use it in an engagement uh, against a live system either. If you have your own copy of, of this target system, like a VM or something, or it's a, it's a CTF or whatever, feel free to use it against it. Um, but don't don't use it against live systems or if you do use a very targeted word list or subset uh, if you know it is a uh, wordpress site or you suspect that it is running wordpress then you can have a very targeted you know maybe 10 or 15 possible uh, words uh, word list that uh, will let you know very quickly if it's if it's a wordpress and like maybe where that is um, also if you do it uh, you know make sure it, especially for a CTF, make sure there's not another way you're supposed to be finding this. Generally speaking, CTFs aren't set up for you to run Durbuster against a web server for like three days straight. Uh, usually there's another stepping stone to find it. And so after I solved this CTF, I, I went back to the write-up and made sure that there wasn't another thing they were trying to teach you here. Um, but I, I didn't find a write-up that had something other than using Derby or Durbuster. Uh, full disclosure, I used Durbuster first. I didn't know about Derby uh, when I did it, but uh, we'll use Derby because that's what they used, and it's kind of a neat little tool. Uh, so we'll uh, run Derby minus H because we want to see what it does. Uh, okay. I guess it doesn't have help. Cool. It just says use host. So we'll do a Derby. Ah, Derby, and then there's the host, uh, and then we'll run it. So, so you can see it's running. It ran just like a ton of different possibilities. Uh, it found your index.php. It ran a ser it sees a server status, uh, and then it found a directory called uploads. Now uploads is pretty cool uh, because um, it, that's likely a uh, a place that we can write to. I mean that's kind of the point of something called uploads. Uh, and on top of that, uh, it's got a <laughs> I should have, uh, this is embarrassing. I should have cleared this out because this is left over from when I did this before. Um, it's likely direct, it's likely, uh, uh, directory listing capable, which it actually tells you here. Um, so, um, yeah, 
These are going to be useless because I used a different uh, IP and port pair, so we're not going to worry about these, but as you can see, this is kind of the path that we took, and this is the path we will take. Um, so we can shut this, this server down. Uh, we're going to move over to our uh, Metasploit server, where, grab the port here. So in Metasploit, there's a ton of stuff, as you can see. Um, if you're not familiar with Metasploit, they've got uh, payload packages, exploit packages. Um, up further up, there's things called auxiliary packages um, that do various things. These are auxiliary or mostly like scanners or uh, just enumeration tools. They're not generally like an exploitation thing or you know what we consider exploitation things. Um, exploits are actual exploits. These are things that are buffer overflowing or um, you know starting and hopefully succeeding in some sort of race condition, uh, stuff like that. And then your payloads are the things that the exploits are actually delivering. That's the stuff that's going to do some sort of um, uh, effect on top of uh, on to the system. So things like uh, we can you know do like i said the bind shells and reverse shells they can just tell it to reboot uh, i think there's a mac payload that just says things you know through the computer speakers which is kind of fun uh, and then there's this concept of post exploitation which are things like uh, i want to you know do some sort of enumeration maybe privesque like privilege escalation stuff things like that so something that i use a lot in uh metasploit um is a module called the multi handler and all this is i'm not even sure why it's in the exploit section but all this is is it's a listener that will wait for reverse shells to connect back to you uh, and then um, set up set up the shell for you so we're going to set the payload uh, to uh, php interpreter once you kind of know your way around, once you use this a lot, I mean, granted, I'm cheating because it's right up here. Um, but once you kind of know your way around, you're like, okay, well, I want a PHP shell. Um, so you type PHP and then tab. And by the way, MSF console is fully tab completable. So I just hit tab. Come on. You're going to make me a liar. There we go. If you don't have the database set up, uh, everything's a little pretty slow. Uh, it's written in Ruby. Ruby's not the fastest language, um, but it is tab completable. So uh, I'm like, oh, I want a PHP and I want a interpreter one. And then you get to the thing and you can like, you know, tab complete and see what's available. Uh, we want to reverse, uh, you know, and see what's available. Sometimes there's a reverse HTTPS, which is pretty cool. Um, but this one is reverse TCP. So we'll set the payload to that. Show our options. We're going to set the L host to our IP address. Uh, 212, yeah. And then we're going to set our L port to this. If you'll notice, I'm not using equal signs. Uh, inside of MSF console, you don't need the equals. Uh, here in MSF Venom, you do, because uh, it's a command line thing. Uh, so then we will exploit minus J. Exploit minus J sets it up as a job. So it doesn't, doesn't hold uh, the console for you. You can do other stuff while it listens. So. We're going to here. Oh, wait, I do still need this. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, we're going to set up our uh, web server. We're going to get it to go to uploads uh, to its legit.php. Actually, we're going to call it shell so we don't get confused with those other things. Uh, and we'll go. We got it, it happened, they got their stuff. Uh, now, we're gonna do this. We see our shell.php. We're gonna get this open so you can see this happen in real time. The the magic of hacking, hack soaring, if you will. Um, click that. You can see that it sends a stage. Now, we don't. we're not gonna get in this, into this today. Um, but there's there's concepts of multi-stage uh, payloads. What at a high level what they are is that the first stage uh, of interpreter, at least in the payload that I picked, um, is just like a, a little bit of the payload that essentially has enough 
intelligence to say, hey, you need to reach out to this IP address and this port, and it'll it'll send you the rest of me. Uh, and this has a couple advantages. One, um, you know, it's it's a it's a memory thing. Uh, if you have to write this first stage to disk, the majority of the malicious content is still sitting on your handler. It's still it's still sitting on your listener, uh, and you'll kind of evade. With Meterpreter, you're not going to evade much, but you know, you're it's less of a footprint that's being put on your disk before it gets read. But once it once it's running, that second stage goes straight to memory, or hopefully goes straight to memory if it's working correctly. The more uh, tangible benefit that you're going to get, uh, at least initially, is that the first stage is going to be much smaller than the full payload. So if you're writing a buffer overflow or you're writing some some exploit that actually has a very small buffer size, you can't fit a lot into it, you can get a really complex payload uh, into that small bit because all you have to do is load the first stage and then you'll reach out and grab the rest of the functionality after. Anyways, so since we're running it as a job, uh, we got our session here. It ran and then it just went back to our our console, right? Well, we can look at the running sessions by running sessions, and then we can go sessions minus i uh, for interact one. And now we're in that session one, and we can do get UID. Now, notice that we're in a interpreter shell. We're not actually in a um, uh, we're not actually in like a bash shell or anything. So. Uh, we'll do a uh, get UID instead of ID. We'll, just, we'll see that we're running uh, www-data, which is a pretty standard user that uh, you know web servers run as. Um, and then you know we can run an ls. We can do a ps uh, to see the the running processes and stuff, which are all good things you know for enumeration. Um, but I want to show a couple more things real quick. Um, we don't have to use the UI. What happens if we're super lead hack source and we don't have a UI installed? Or maybe we're pivoting through another machine and, and that machine doesn't have a UI installed. Um, just real quick, and this is pretty basic for those of you who really know what you're doing, but uh, curl is an amazing command. Uh, and we can uh, curl the uh, this, this address, um, 192, ah, 192.168. Uh, 1.213, um, and then uh, dash dash data, uh, and this is the, actually, I'm going to make myself dumb if I don't confirm this, uh, yeah, dash dash data, okay, so when we're doing a post, which this is a post, uh, post means that you're, you're submitting a form, um, the difference between a, uh, is it, let's find out, this is why burp is super useful, uh, here, so this is a post request. The difference between a post and a get is that get parameters are always in the URL, uh, whereas a post post parameters are always in the uh, in the body. So we can actually see here how this is set up, um, and in fact we can even see our uh, our attempts to exploit this. Right. So here we are um, trying to upload uh, upload the shell. This is exactly the body. Of the thing, and this is what we'd paste inside of the uh, data. So we can do this: uh, nine two one six eight one dot two one three data, uh, and then go. And so what this will do? Ah, maybe. Yeah. So what this does is it just outputs the code uh, that we would have gotten from the browser, right? So everything worked the same way that we expect it to. Uh, and then we can again get, or instead of uh, posting, we can get. So we'll just curl HTTP uh, 192.168.1.213. Uh, and then we'll go to uploads and then shell.php. No socket. How dare you? Uh, did I fuck this up? Well, that should have totally worked. Let's see here. See, this is what happens when you go off script and try and show extra stuff. 
demo gods always hate you for it. They're like, oh, you thought you were going to do more? Well, you can't. What if we just wget? wget is another cool uh, command line uh, web functionality tool. Um, yeah, that just downloads it. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, why are you being so mean to me? Okay, well, hmm. Here's a neat, um, neat functionality of burp. If you want to do something again, uh, but as a curl command, you could just right click on the history on the, um, you know, when it was doing it, when it did last time, uh, copy as curl command. This is useful because you can actually do more fun stuff like, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you want to run uh, like bash scripts against, uh, you know, do fuzzing some input parameters or something, you can do that. Um, yeah, it just really doesn't like doing it this way. Well, that's mean. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, send this to repeater. So this is the this is where we actually hit the shell. This is when we made it do its thing. Uh, we just send it to repeater so that we can repeat it as often as we want. Uh, and again, I use this similar to how you'd copy and paste the curl command into bash. Uh, I use this for subtle uh, enumerations or subtle changes to go over and over again. That's mean. I don't know why it's doing this, but we already have our session, so we'll go into the sessions. We will. We shall continue on. We shall move forward. Um, so, what do we do now? Uh, let's um, take a look at what's going on. Of course, we're in the uh, var www html uploads directory, uh, and here's all the shells that I, you know, uploaded. Totally today. Totally didn't happen yesterday. Some of them. Um, so where are we? What do we want to do? Uh, we want to start enumerating. We want to figure out how we can get root, uh, which is mostly the, uh, you know, the, uh, the goal of most CTFs, uh, at least boot to roots, right? So some of the common things we want to do is, uh, check users. Uh, can we look at Etsy shadow? No. Um, what about, uh, let's just LS Etsy. Is there a, there are backups for password. Um, password doesn't have bad uh, uh, permissions, so the shadow backup probably won't either. Yeah, so those are, you know, fine. Um, let's drop into a shell real quick. Let's do a sudo minus L. Uh, sudo can't even be ran by this user, uh, which is, you know, not abnormal. Um, we did see, maybe we didn't, maybe I was going too fast, but we did see uh, there is a CTF user here um, in the home CTF user uh, directory. So let's take a look at him and see what we've got. Uh, we can take a look and everybody's got read access to CTF user. So let's go into his directory. Uh, and we've got um you know the general stuff that we'd find in a home directory and then we've got this binary um at least i think it's binary uh it's got execute permissions so it's probably a binary but uh we'll do a file my db con checker on it yes it's an elf it's a 64-bit elf uh but it's readable and executable by everyone uh once again this is owner and this is group and this is everyone else and it's read write execute <clears throat> so it's readable and executable by everyone, and, and this is the important thing, it's ran by root, or it's owned by root. So this has a high potential for uh, very uh, interesting stuff. Um, let's take a look. So if we run, if we run it, let's just run it real quick, mydbcon checker. Um, what does this do? Program will now connect to the MySQL database server. That's very interesting. Um, logging status to syslog, you know, that's pretty standard. And like, here's all the tables that it has. Um, what really interests me is this. It connects to the database server, which means that 
it likely has some way to do that. Um, I'm hoping uh, that it will be credentials. Um, I'm actually not sure. I'm not a I'm not a big MySQL guru, so I don't know if there's something like if it has some sort of key that it could have, or uh, you know, in the MySQL server, it's got like some whitelist for this application. I don't know, um, but it, this is a strong indication to me that it's got some sort of uh, uh, credentials. So let's use one of my favorite commands, strings, uh, to take a look at my DB con checker. <clears throat> and that is a ton of stuff. So let's scroll up to the top here. Ah, too far, too far. And here's where we run strings on it. Kind of start looking for stuff. And in fact, this is useless. What we're really looking for is it's likely doing its login around here. So if we do something like copy this, and do strings on my db con checker and then we're, we're going to grep and we're going to use the tack capital a5 and tack capital b5 and that's that's above and below what we uh, uh what we're matching uh so we want five lines above and five lines below as kind of a um um you know context and actually we'll do 10 just cuz um we want context around our match I think we need to put those in quotes. So now we have, you know, 10 lines above and below this line. Uh, here's some junk. And here's connecting to MySQL database on uh, 127001 using root Rorschach. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, and here again, we can see, you know, root and Rorschach together. That's another indication that maybe Rorschach is a, uh, a credential. So <clears throat> we're going to save these because, you know, I like possible credentials. Um, and we're going to, I want to take a look at the MySQL database. Uh, I want to see what we can use, pivot these uh, credentials into. So we're going to MySQL U root P. Uh, we're going to do this guy. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, what is it? I think it's minus E uh, for execute command. If you've noticed, we don't have a prompt in here. This is something maybe I should have touched on. Uh, we don't have a prompt here. Uh, and the reason that we don't have a prompt here is because we're not running in a full um, like environment, Linux environment. This is a, um, a shell that we've dropped into uh, because of Meterpreter. <clears throat> we're running on a com on a uh, user that if we look up here in Etsy password, uh, where is the www data? Www data uh, does not have a shell. Uh, no login is its is its shell. It's a proof shell. Uh, this is not a normal. I don't think we're a TTY. Uh, and what what that means, I'm not even going to get into because even I'm kind of nebulous on that. Um, but it's not a good shell. So trying to run things like VI or less or uh, anything with any sort of uh, interaction to it is going to cause you pain. Some things will work, some things won't, some things will break in unexpected ways, it's just a pain in the ass. Uh, so that's why I didn't strings uh, pipe to less. And that's why we're going to put our username and password in the command line. And then we're going to use the minus E, I believe it's E, uh, minus E to just execute the commands one at a time. And we'll run help. Okay, so we run MySQL help. Uh, let's kind of see what some of the stuff we can do here. Um, there's the help thing that we looked at. Uh, we can exit, that's not useful here. Um, send a command to the MySQL server, that could be useful. Um, changing the prompts, blah. What is this? Execute a system shell command. Uh, so let's see if we can do that. Uh, let's see if we can be super cheeky and just straight off the bat do this. Have an error. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't actually do the thing, right? So we have to do this, uh, 
uh, backslash exclamation point. So backslash exclamation point, then sh. Now what happens if we ID? Suddenly, suddenly we have an effective UID of zero, uh, which is the root.